Well, it's been a while since uh, Dave Syverson and I have uh, produced a video together on the Arlads Football Network. And Dave, uh, we get the opportunity to uh, join once once together as we do a mock draft uh, right now for April 15th. Yeah, tax day. Oh, yeah, I know. I still have to do my taxes later. <laughs> So, yeah, this is like the last project of the day, and then my taxes are yep. at night. So, uh, anyway, so happy tax day to everybody. Uh, Dave Syverson here, uh, one of the uh, lead scouts over at Our Lads, uh, the Our Lads Football Network at ourlads.com, of course. And if you are watching this on the Our Lads Football channel, you know who Dave is, or at least you should be, unless you're a new viewer. And if you are, well, make sure to subscribe, uh, because this is the best time of year to subscribe. Uh, these draft guides have just come out. So I got a hold of one just a few days ago. I can't put it down. Uh, and if you would prefer a PDF version, uh, that's available too. Uh, and you can go to the rlads.com website. We're going to have a link in the description of uh, the video. I know I'm also going to post this on Prime Sports Network. So I'll have a link in the description of, uh, of uh, that channel where we're going to have a whole bunch of links, including how you can check out Dave's uh, videos and, and uh, all, all sorts of cool stuff. So Dave, uh, you've been real busy with videos over at rlads. We have been. It's been a really fun, interesting last few months. Um, if you know much about our lads, we, we know, in, in my opinion, this is a good thing, but we're very old school. You know, we still print our draft guide and, and send it out via the mail. And we do have a PDF version available now, uh, but that just goes to show there aren't many of those left uh, in circulation. You know, printable paper bag draft guides. And I still think they're going to make a comeback at some point, but. You know, it just goes, that's just like kind of like a microcosm of, of what our lads is. It's just old school, traditional scouting with a ton of tape, a ton of collaboration between myself and, and the rest of the staff. And we come up with our, our collaborative grades. And it's uh, it's a fun thing, you know, d agreements, disagreements, sharing some information, um, some of which we put out there, some of which we have to keep to ourselves. And it's just been, uh, it's been a really past few, uh, fun, fast, a fun past few months that now we're kind of evolving into the next era of our lads with a YouTube channel and a little bit more media, a little bit more plans coming up down the pipe. And uh, it's been it's been a fun few months. Yes, it has. And it's now at that point where we're getting serious with these mock drafts. Matter of fact, we just did a live mock draft. Uh, what was that, a week ago? Two weeks ago, because we, did, the, yeah, the, two weeks. The, we yep. did a needs video last week. Um, and we are not sure uh, what we're going to do with the NFC. I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll do one because we did the AFC. Uh, not sure we're going to do it. I don't think we're doing it live, though. So we'll just keep you updated on that. Uh, since we did an AFC one, I'm sure we'll do an NFC one. Maybe it'll be me and you again. Who knows? Uh, but we'll get together and do a few more videos for sure before the draft. All right. Now, I want to check out. I'll tell you what. I'm going to pop this up so you can check out the rlads.com website. Now, this is how you would, like, let's just, for instance, you go to the rlads uh, site here. You see, real easy, buy draft guide. So okay. can't get any easier cool. than that. And you open this up, and there you are. This is where you can get the, the guide, the review guide. We'll be working on that real soon after the draft. So our work is never done. You got the PDF version here. Uh, and uh, you can also, of course, put uh, a few things together. Uh, and uh, why not? I mean, if you want, you can get the hard copy and the PDF. And then, of course, you go to the depth chart page. And this is where we love to check things out there. Um, and I also want to show everybody, because we're going to use this. These are your rankings. So we're going to use these uh, today. So you've got your quarterback rankings running back and all the way down for each position so as we start going through each position and we start th thinking a little bit harder it'll be a little bit easier in the beginning but once we start getting you know middle to late then we're going to really start taking a look at these rankings and see who's left on the board so forth and so on i've got the ticker on the bottom of the screen hopefully that'll work out okay uh but so far so good and let's get started so let's do it uh, all right dave uh so who gets the first pick who'd you say so yeah, we. I think we could just move on to the second pick. Because, yeah, you know, I know, right? Let me. Yeah, I, I should have just typed that in already. So. First pick is, is signed, sealed, delivered, uh, Caleb Williams. But I guess you know, as you're typing that in, we can kind of just, you know, kind of dive into what are we doing here? Are we going after what we think will happen? What we think should happen? And I, I believe that as we get closer to the actual NFL draft, I mean, we're only ten days away now. 
uh, th this needs to kind of more steer more towards what we think is going to happen, you know, prediction based. And, you know, we get to throw our input in here and there. As you can see, my number one quarterback after the entire grading process was Jaden Daniels. Uh, but I think they're going to take Caleb, as does everyone else at this point. Um, it was it was pretty much a sure thing to me when I saw at USC's Pro Day, I saw someone wearing Bears memorabilia and I, or Bears hat and shirt and jacket. And I said, I don't know who that is. It's not a coach. Doesn't look like a scout. It was Keenan Allen, the wide receiver for the Bears. That basically just said, okay, this guy is going to support his future quarterback. Everything else right now is just for show. Uh, this pick has already been made. It's Caleb Williams all day. Yeah, and uh, good to point that out. Uh, and, and we'll let you know who we would take as well. Like you said, Jaden Daniels. And isn't it interesting because when we did our first video, which was, what, a couple of months ago, I think, and we were yeah. talking about, like, an early look ahead. Yep. It, it, it was – we were both surprised that we were both, like, in sync with Jaden Daniels as the top quarterback. And then sure enough, same thing with the top brass over at our lads. Uh, so everybody in mutual agreement that Jaden Daniels should be the top quarterback. I, I, yeah, I think that's a good thing. It's, yeah, it is a good thing. It kind of makes the decision easier because especially a quarterback, when you have half the, you know, this is also uh, last year, our, our consensus was C.J. Stroud was quarterback one in last year's group, but we had a couple guys that thought Bryce Young should have been up there. And it makes for interesting debate and interesting conversation. But this one, it, it was, uh, I, I don't know many people that are, have Jaden over Caleb. And by no means do we think Caleb is a poor quarterback. No. Right? We've, evaluated, we've evaluated thousands of players dating back to last summer and he's going to finish as as our number two player or maybe number three if you want to put marvin harrison up there so you know we like caleb a lot we think that he's unique i think if he hits his ceiling his upside is higher than Jaden daniels uh, but i feel safer with Jaden, and i like how his career trajectory what has actually happened on the field over the past five years going from arizona state to lsu and just everything everything about his game, I just I trust just at a slightly higher level than Caleb. All right, so who does have the second pick now? So now we're going to Washington. All right. And that's you. That's me. Okay, so then, yeah, I mean, the board is going to be the board. So really, this is going to come down to whether or not it's Daniels or May. That's what right. we're hearing. And nothing has slipped. Uh, at, at, at some point in the next probably few days, I think we're going to get an idea, sort of like last I, year. I will, I will say I got a message this morning that it's going to be Jaden. You did? Okay. So let's go ahead so and put him in there. Then. Um, you know, it's. I don't think it's going to be in the news, but there's. I don't have many sources. I am not Adam Schefter. I am not, I am not one of those guys, but there's every now and then this close to the draft, I do get a couple little – you know, knee jerks here. Like, hey, guess what? And it's. Uh, I was told it's going to be Jaden to to Washington. All right. Well, there you go. And look, good for them uh, for a few reasons, including the fact that I hope it doesn't give the Patriots an opportunity to get him as a Jet fan. Uh, yeah. Even though we're hearing that if he was available, they, they may not go that route, route uh, which I would be ecstatic about. I do not want Jaden Daniels in the AFC East. So <laughs> please, Washington, I hope that works out. Okay, so then the Patriots go, and this is very well could happen. So they're up. Now, some people are even thinking, could it be J.J. McCarthy? But Drake May is, is, is like the unanimous th top three. You have, though. McCarthy is your third overall quarterback. And yep. then there's another option. Now, look, we're not doing trades, but there's right. a lot also out there about should the Patriots kind of punt on the first season with the new head coach and there's so many needs that they have that if they trade out here because they do have needs at wide receiver, big needs, wide receiver, quarterback, and offensive line, that if they trade down, they can take care of two big needs in one draft and that might still be taking a quarterback, but they could just go, you know what, let's trade down, let's get a wide receiver, let's get a number one wide receiver, let's get a, a, a number one tackle, and then we'll, pet, we'll go with the quarterback in the second or third round. If that works out, great. If it doesn't, for, you know, or we'll be a top 10 drafted team next year, and we'll do whatever it takes to get our, our quarterback then. That could happen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what you think, what the percentages are that that would happen, but I'm, I'm thinking that's, uh, that's at least 50-50 to me. Yeah, it, it's. A, I would say it's a coin flip, and to me, this is where the draft starts, and it's going to be a dramatic night. I hope. I hope things stay under wrap because this right now seems like it's going to be the most exciting top ten draft that we've had in a really long time. 
and it starts right here at number three overall. Um, I believe if they go quarterback, it will be Drake May. I believe I'm in the minority when I have J.J. McCarthy above him based on ceiling and upside, a couple of recent big arm projects, Justin Herbert, Josh Allen, that have panned out uh, because they got put into really good situations. And, you know, a front office that is starting from the starting over, even though they're all in-house, right? New head coach, new GM are in-house replacements, but it is year one for them. And that's where confidence is the highest. Hey, we have a long-term plan. Uh, new GM, Elliot Wolf, uh, he was the former director of scouting. Uh, his father is the, the infamous Ron Wolf, um, a Hall of Fame executive from Green Bay and the author of The Packer Way. Uh, the Packer Way, it's a great book. Um, it's very basic. It's meant for small businesses, but you can actually relate this to football. And there's nine steps. And Elliot Wolf has said, we're going to build this like the Packers okay. have built their. So the first two steps. That means wide one, receivers not going to be a part of that. Exactly. I think I think wide receiver is not even an option. I think there's two options. You trade down or you pick the quarterback. And, you know, step one of the Packer way is identify what needs to be fixed. They identified the quarterback needs to be fixed. What do they do? They trade Mac Jones to be a backup in Jacksonville. And then step two of the Packer way, hire the best before anyone else does. And that, to me, in, in regard to the NFL draft, is get the quarterback before everyone else does. Drake May is going to have a market in this league if he passes by three and they go elsewhere or they trade out. And just considering that the Green Bay Packers are okay with taking a quarterback and sitting him on the bench for an entire year, no pressure from the outside will make them put him on the field. That's the situation Drake May needs to be in. And Drake May is the best pure pocket passer in this class. Uh, both his arm his size and his ability to maneuver within the pocket with his eyes downfield. He is very, very good in that department, better than everybody else. There are issues with his game. He scares the living crap out of me, but so did Josh Allen. That's so true. did Justin yeah. Herbert. So the Jacoby He does Brissett, have a lot of Josh Allen in, in him, doesn't he? He does, but I will say one thing Josh Allen has that he did, Josh Allen was a lot tougher and just a lot. Uh, Josh Allen is part of what makes Josh Allen so good is he's so tough to get to the ground and he makes a lot happen with his legs. And Drake may is a good athlete, but he's not as tough as Josh Allen is. Josh Allen's got a lot of farmer boy in him. You know, he wants to get into a street fight. I don't see that in Drake may. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, after considering trade offers from the Vikings and the giants, who I don't think either one of those teams are going to overpay for a quarterback, especially if JJ McCarthy is still in play. I think new England's going to sit tight and take Drake may. All right, <clears throat> so let me go ahead and type that in there. So Drake, and, and what would you say the biggest concern is uh, for Drake May? Just really inconsistent. Um, and, and the inconsistency issues come from a lot of his lower body techniques. He does have a, a kind of like a different lower body, not just his footwork, his hips. They, it, it's He throws the ball differently. And he, he's just, you know, the, the one, the basketball illustration I gave here is he, he'll hit five threes in a row and then he'll go miss two layups and a free throw. It's, it just doesn't make sense. And that, that consistency can hurt you in college, but you could still survive in the NFL. You won't survive. Okay. Arizona's next. And uh, we know Arizona's not taking a quarterback. Mm. Uh, isn't it funny how things change so dramatically? Like towards the end of last season, there were so many whispers and so many like pundits Oh, this is such a great quarterback class. They're just gonna they're, they're just gonna dump uh, Murray and they're gonna get their new quarterback. That's just and then all of a sudden the last like month or two, you know, crickets. And that's because Jonathan Gannon has made it known. Everybody knows now that he loves uh, Murray. Uh, that he's he's gonna be there for as long as as Gannon's there. So you can I mean that's why that's not even been talked about anymore. But Arizona has eleven picks. Uh, they have um, two in the first, correct? Yep. Two, yeah, in, the two first. in the first. Yep. What was that f deal for? That was, I mean, they maneuvered a lot in the draft oh. last year. They, they traded out so that uh, Houston could trade up for Will Anderson. They got, okay. a, they got a King's Ransom for that. And then they traded back up to grab uh, Paris Johnson, but they still won out. Um, oh, yeah. They really worked the phones well last year and put themselves in a good spot. Yeah, they have six picks in the first three rounds. But their top needs are wide receiver, as far as I'm, as far as my research, wide receiver, edge, and corner. So um, 
And of course, Marvin Harrison is just staring there right in front of everybody's faces as the wide receiver. I think it's a little bit early for edge and corner. So I'm, just, I'm not even going to screw around, and I'm just going to go ahead and take Marvin Harrison. Yeah, easy choice there. Um, and it, it, it's there's there's a lot to like about Harrison Jr. beyond just his name. <laughs> you know, it's not just the, the, the lineage that he has. He He's by far the most polished receiver, and... You know, he, he didn't work out, which was weird to me, um, even at his pro day. And I kind of like the answer. His, his agent probably was all over this because it made him look good that he didn't want to waste any time, you know, or lose any time making himself a – trying to make himself a better wide receiver by running 40s and shuttles and three cones. Like, go watch the tape. Um, you know, 40 times – I'm wondering. I was talking to a couple of draft analysts leading up to – the combine that a lot of these guys that back out, it just becomes more and more common every year. They don't want to run all the drills. And it's because part of the reason is the GPS uh, data that you get from tracking these guys that all teams have access to, you know, do you really care about the 40 time or do you care how fast these guys move on game day? And Harrison has constantly clocked in at 23 miles an hour. And that's usually reserved for guys that are four, four or best. So, you know, that he plays to a speed, I also think he's a more polished route runner than all these guys, so he plays faster than his times. Um, it's just it, it feels safe with Marvin Harrison. I think that's exactly what Kyler Murray needs. Do you think that? Because uh, I I happen to believe it, and uh, but look, I understand how talented this receiver class is, but do you think that there is a? Uh, uh, most people think okay, they've got a top three, and then you start with the next. Is it really though a one, and then a two, three, and then the rest? So I, I label them 1A, 1B, 1C. I have them, like I have okay. my own numerical grading system, and they are, they're right there with each so other. So you don't I, really I have, think Harrison is a way ahead of a Odunze or Neighbors? I don't. I okay. don't. And it's not, a, it's not a knock on Harrison at all. Um, Odunze and Neighbors both have traits, standout physical traits, that Harrison does not. And there are a couple of things about Harrison Jr. game that doesn't make, uh, is he really, can, is he going to be a Justin Jefferson type? Like, is he that competitive? To, you know, you don't see him break a lot of tackles. You're right. You don't That's, see him get yeah. get over and stay over the top yep. vertically. You know, it's you know, is, is can he be you know, can he be his father, which is a Hall of Fame receiver? You're going to take that top five all day. Uh, but with the recent influx of receivers that come into the league and impact the game right away at a high level for a rookie contract price, it's one of the the best bargains in football right now, and that's why. You know, I think you're going to see a couple of receivers traded draft weekend that are just saying that they're end of the rookie deal. Let's grab one of these guys. And, you know, but that, that's the thing about Harrison Jr. is like, you know, he's going to be good, but I don't think he's got this limitless ceiling. I would even say the ceiling of Odunze and neighbors is higher than Harrison, but the floor is much higher with Harrison. Okay, next up, uh, this would be the first pick under the Harbaugh regime. And uh, we also get into a situation where we wonder, is this... Uh, also a trade possibility because mm. uh, you know he's going to want to reshape a lot even though the roster is good but you know he's going to want to reshape it and the other question is going to be how many ex uh, Wolverines will end up on the team uh, probably more guys like the middle round guys and maybe even some free agents I'll probably get the free yeah. agents so he'll get whoever he wants but uh, yeah the, the, and, and it could you know, maybe even some former guys maybe Eric All uh, ends up on the team you know that kind of yeah. thing so but yeah. th they want to take advantage of the fact that Harbaugh especially for the first couple of years he's recruited a lot of these guys and whether they were made it to Michigan or not he knows these guys he's not going to know them as much in three or four years so they got to take advantage of these these couple of years while he still has a lot of film uh, familiarity with these kids yeah you know th this is a tough call it's funny in january uh when the our lads channel was just starting i was asked to make a few reels and you know get some of our mock, my mock draft material out there and and i mocked uh joe alt to the chargers and nobody was on that page at that time and i just said like hey harbaugh is a he wants to draft linemen he, Absolutely. Like, he likes to control he wants to control the line of scrimmage. He's going to run the ball. Um, I could see him going after Blake Corm at some point just for the fam <laughs> yeah. familiarity, yeah. but also just the – he's got that NFL back in him in Blake Corm. And if he gets into the right situation like this one, I think he does well. But then I did not expect them to get rid of Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. I did believe they would get rid of one of them. Uh -huh. And 
So that that was a red flag to me in terms of them going tackle right away. So, but not enough to make me cross it off. Part two, they didn't sign anyone. I mean, look at the R Lads depth chart that you have up right there right now. Nobody is in that aqua color. And the aqua color is reserved for guys that they brought into the system this year via free agency. And um, you our, mean a receiver? Uh, yeah, they didn't bring any receivers in. Yeah, they only you have uh, four guys. Yeah, I mean, that, that, so you are guaranteed they're going to draft at least one uh, wide receiver. And Darius Davis, the slot that you have up there, he's he's a return specialist. Oh, yeah. He yeah. was drafted last year for that reason. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I know every coach is going to say, oh, he could be a slot, he could be a gimmick, a gadget guy. He, you don't want him as your number three. So I, I really feel like they're missing a starter right now, wide receiver. And they're staring. And Quentin Johnston, who was drafted in the first round last year, that's a previous regime, did not have a good rookie season. He was a guy that we said it was going to take a couple of years anyway. So I don't I don't think you count him out. But you know what Josh Palmer is. You can get that guy anytime in free agency or the draft. So I look at this wide receiver room, and I think it's it's one of the worst five in football. And You'd be right. The right tackle, Trey Pipkins, I wouldn't call him good, but he's serviceable. For now. He has, a con- he has a contract. You can't get rid of it this year. He's he's on this team this year. There's no question he's going to be on this team. So now I'm starting to talk myself out of drafting a left tackle do to it. put him at right tackle that might be playing behind Trey Pipkins uh-huh. while you also have all pro receivers staring you right in the eyes. And the last kicker here is I did some research on Harbaugh when he was with the Niners as a head coach and as a head coach at Michigan, he wasn't a blue chip offensive lineman guy. He had a style of guys that he wanted. And what did he do? He he attacked the transfer portal and got these fifth year graduate students that had one year left that really projected to be fifth, sixth, seventh undrafted free agent type grades. They weren't dominant offensive linemen. They played well together and combined with his system, they did well. Um, you know, some could question how good they were pa- pass blocking in 2023, but it was still a good offensive line. But it was a, it was patchwork. You know, it, it was a uh, kind of random pieces. And knowing his propensity to not attack offensive lines super early when he was with the Niners, I'm going with wide receiver here. And because of what they did with Johnson last year, I think they're going to get a different flavor okay. and go after Malik Neighbors. Okay. Now, question regarding uh, Alt. Is yeah. this too early for Alt? No, it's not. I have I have a really high grade on Alt and Fashanu, and if they are saying, "Hey, we want two really good tackles to protect our franchise quarterback," it's not too early. The risk is, and not everyone agrees with me when I say this, it's not super easy to transition from left tackle to right tackle. Most guys can do it. Some guys can't, though. So, you know, Alt is not this like. You know, all pro projection. There are some things I don't like about his tape. That's why he finished as my number two tackle. Um, Fashano is my number one, but um, just in terms of long term projection and these guys reaching their ceiling. Uh, but I don't think it's too early. I wouldn't criticize the pick, but you got to tell me what you're doing at receiver. It, it's almost like you you put yourself in a position where you have to take a receiver in round two, and now you lose control of who's there. Um. Look, I think when you're talking just about uh, pure talent um, and, uh, and and also the fact that we just don't know. We could say what we want about Harbaugh College, but we all just don't know. And right. he also has a general manager. So right. we don't know. Um, so picking neighbors makes a lot of sense just based on what you talked about. Um, right. I think, though... I have. I actually believe that there's more of a likelihood that the Chargers trade than the Patriots trade. I think the Chargers are trading out of here, even if it's just yeah. a few spots, because someone's going to want a quarterback. I think. I think the Chargers are letting everybody know that if you if you want JJ McCarthy, come get him, um, and because we want to move down, especially if you want to leapfrog the Giants, who might everybody believes might be targeting McCarthy. So, uh, so I think that's a perfect spot for anybody, Minnesota, anybody that wants McCarthy and you want to go ahead of the Giants. I think this is what's going to happen because I do. And, and, and it also, also opens up the opportunity, possibly, if they trade down a couple of spots, to take Brock Bowers. Okay. So uh, we know that Disley, uh, one check, great great blocking tight end. So he's got the one check. Yep. But he doesn't have the check for a receiver at tight end. And we know how big that's going to be for him. And if he can get Brock Bowers on this team, he's not taking him at five, but if he can get Brock Bowers on this team, 
uh, I think he'd be obviously ecstatic. Um, but yeah, I mean, just knowing him as a Michigan fan, it's about the trenches. It's about building that offensive line, as you said. Um, I'm intrigued by what you also said about all whether or not he can play right compared to left and all of that. No, that's a valid. Um, uh, and, and, and now let me ask you a question: If he trades down and all, who knows where he trades down? But let's just say all's off the board. Which of the other tackles would fit more as a right tackle? Mm, good question. Um, not Fashanu. I, w- I would probably say Amarius Mims would be the swing for the wow. fence. Um, really? He's only started. He's only. He, he, well, he's only started seven games. J.C. Latham would probably give him a run for his money. This is what my thought on Amarius Mims is, and I'm sure he's going to get drafted somewhat in this mock. But it, if this kid hits eighty percent of his ceiling, he's a Pro Bowler. Yeah, he's and. The risk is he has started seven games. There's a couple of different injuries on a 350-pound frame. You know, that that always concerns me. Like, there is such a thing as being too big for, for the NFL, especially if you have lower body injuries, um, that it, they're just harder to bounce back from. And But I, I really like this kid's game, and he is a, as much of a road grader as anyone. Uh, I love Troy Falutano. I have a higher grade on him. I don't know if he's the best ideal fit for the right side at, at tackle. So, I mean, you really have three guys staring you in the eyes that, that you know, if he trades down, he doesn't have to panic if these guys start getting, you know, picked off one by one because you have Flutano, Mims, Latham, and even Fuaga, who it was a right tackle at Oregon State, would be really good fits for what they want to do. Okay. Giants are next, and a, a lot of talk about McCarthy, which is why I said there's a chance that maybe a team uh, pops ahead of him and uh, makes a deal with the Chargers. I I don't think that's happening. I think with Daniel Jones on the roster, you still got the same head coach who agreed to the deal. I think they're going to give Daniel Jones a shot. I, I just do. And, and honestly, I think if the head coach believed in Daniel Jones last year, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't give him another shot. So um, the big question, though, now becomes offensive line is such a big need then. Also wide receiver, yeah. but now we go to what you just talked about. Okay? Now, we can't really judge, and that's why uh, we're not going to get into it, whether or not or we'll all fit there, or Fashano, and, and, and so forth. So I'm just going to go best offensive lineman, let them work it out, um, and go with Alt as the okay. pick for the Giants here. Got it. Uh, what would you be yeah. uh, what, what would you be considering here as well? Um, Odunze or Alt. It would come down you to would. one of those okay. two. Um, I, I mean, I'm a McCarthy guy. I do agree with you, and I've been saying this for a long time. I've been getting a lot of hate for this too. <laughs> that it just, to me, I would take McCarthy or Odunze, uh, just one of those two. I don't think the front office is going to give up on Jones. They just signed him last year. Yep. He played six games behind, behind an awful offensive line to a rich contract that you can't get out of this year and next year it's going to cost 27 mil to get out of so you kind of lose this whole rookie quarterback contract window by drafting someone and you know it's going to be a horrific situation they draft a quarterback and daniel jones marches out there and throws an interception week one i mean it's you know it it, these guys in the nfl they have egos and they, they put their ego on the line with daniel jones and they have drew Locke as a safety net that I think they're going to try to build around Daniel Jones at least for another year and see what he can do in a much more favorable situation. And favorable situation can come from a more dynamic playmaker in Roma Dunze or keep him upright uh, because his injuries are coming from just getting hit too much. I mean, the Giants allowed more sacks than anyone in the NFL last year. And, I mean, they were setting records early in the year with how often their quarterbacks were getting hit. So Joe Alt comes in and essentially moves – Evan Neal into a guard spot. And now you have a real legitimate competition between a couple of the signings they made in free agency, Evan Neal, Joe Alt, and we say, dude, best five are playing. Let's see what you got. You know, I mean, I don't know what happened to Evan Neal. As of right now, this is one of my biggest misses ever uh, along the offensive line. And that's that's an area where I'm really confident scouting and projecting to the NFL. I don't know. I I went back and watched his college tape this, this past winter. And he looks like a different dude. He, he's not moving the same. It's just, it's a weird thing. And maybe it's coaching. Could or maybe be. he got maybe he got comfortable. So now Joe Alt's going to come in and be like, no more comfort here. You're getting shifted inside or you're going to get traded. 
Yeah. And I think that, that might be what you how you get the best out of Evan Neal as a guard. He did play guard his freshman year at Alabama, so he can do it. That might not be a – yeah, exactly. And maybe that's that's the perfect switch for him before yeah. he does land somewhere else. Uh, who yeah. knows? Maybe another team comes around during the draft and says, hey, you know, how much for Evan Neal? Um, mm-hmm. Not that they'll get much, but uh, that's uh, maybe something that does happen if they draft uh, an offensive tackle first. Okay. Tennessee, you're up next. And, and uh, I think Tennessee fans have to be really excited uh, because I think they've, they've, they've made some really interesting – bold moves uh, in free agency with the new head coach, uh, Brian Callahan coming in. They've get uh, they, they, they've get the, the master offensive line coach, which is so huge for this team. There's, yeah. I don't think there's an assistant coach in the NFL that is as much of a difference maker outside yeah. of the coordinators as Callahan as the offensive line coach. And we know how much this team needs that. And they still need offensive linemen. We talked about that last year. So, um, yeah, th- this is a team that has offensive line needs and so forth. They had the big splash move for Calvin Ridley and a few other interesting moves, including Pollard. They get their center. So what do you think about Tennessee? Is this an obvious slam dunk, definite decision move here? To me, it is. Uh, they've done a great job adding pieces on, on both sides of the ball, especially just a little bit of support system for this young quarterback. Now they're entering this Will Levis era now, and he flashed last year. I actually yeah. was somewhat impressed when, when he got on the field. I mean, to me, he immediately looked better and added a different dimension to that uh, offense than Ryan Tannehill did. And not that Ryan Tannehill is, is heading towards Canton, but to do this as a second round pick in year one, I, w- I was impressed. Now it's about building around him and Tony Pollard and Cushenberry and Calvin Ridley still have DeAndre Hopkins, still have... Oh, yeah. Tr- Ridley Tr- and Burks. Hopkins. Yeah. And Burks. It, 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 there's talent there, but yeah. it doesn't matter if you can't keep them upright. That's and right. And that's the one area they, they didn't address tackle. Um, I know they have, they have a, a backup in, in Leroy Watson, but Olu Fushano is a guy that at this time last year almost came out. He was like the Amarius Mims of last year. He was not very experienced, but we knew this kid was going to be good. He decided to go back to school. And I was ready to almost just, you know, etch it in stone. This kid's going to be tackle one in this class, an elite Pro Bowl projection. And I'll tell you what, 2023, it didn't go as well as I thought. But I still think there are pieces to his game that you cannot teach. There are there. He's a very young kid. He's very smart. He's mature. He just had a couple bad beats against future first-round picks from Ohio State. I mean, really, the Ohio yeah. State tape is what hurt him. And if the kid has a bad game or two, I don't know if it's enough for me to take him out of that that top ten consideration. Oh, yeah. Franchise left tackle, you know, signed, sealed, delivered. You know, they lose they lose a they use an early pick on Peter Skaronsky, who shifted inside to left guard, which is what we thought would happen, uh, no matter what. I think you put Fashano in that left tackle, a position that allowed 88 pressures for Tennessee last year, which was number one in the NFL, between just a revolving door of guys that just don't belong in a starting lineup at that spot. You know, this is a pretty easy choice for me for so many reasons, and I still believe in Fashano. He's my pick here at number seven. Yeah, I I agree. This is a slam dunk. And uh, and even the right tackle – was was better last year so that was promising so all of a sudden you know i tell you right now they they bring this they bring in a offensive tackle which i think we both agree is going to happen with 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 last year's draft the offseason this offseason this draft they're going to be one of the top 10 offensive lines of football yeah because the, the coach yeah, and, yeah. and, and I'll tell you with. what, the coach, his previous two stops, Cleveland and Washington, that franchise, whatever, both those franchises, in his first or second year with that team, used their first-round pick on a, on a high first-round pick on an offensive lineman. In Washington, it was Brandon Sheriff from Iowa, and in Cleveland, it was Jedrick Wills from Cleveland. Uh, sorry, from uh, Alabama. So interesting that that I didn't can, work out. That that's the interesting thing is that that's why it shows you what a great offensive line coach is going to be. First of all, it, you're not going to hit on everybody, uh-huh. um, but it was it's not just that he elevated the easy first round guy. It's that he elevated yeah. all the other guys that nobody right. really even ever heard of before. Yeah, yeah. So I think no matter what they do, it, it's going. I think he's going to have a big say in like, hey, yeah, let's let's get this guy. Let me develop him. Let's let's get this thing on the right track. All right, Atlanta. 
and uh, this will uh, uh, put an end to the first quarter of our draft here. And uh, the Falcons, of course, had a big decision last year, and they decided, yes, we're going to punt on the season. We're going to make this is the, the big off season. Uh, and 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 they started out, of course, with the with the with the coaching change, and so forth. Um, overall, you take a look, and uh, they also, of course, by losing their coach, who just had n- wanted nothing to do with their wide receiver uh, uh, game, uh, and uh, and and that's why it's going to be an interesting switch now, depending on exactly what kind of talent they have at that room that they've added the most free agents to that room, which is not a surprise, including Mooney and Moore via trade. Uh, so um, I think that they're in good shape there. But, you know, the Falcons, if you look at it, uh, I, uh, you know, they, they still have got... To, I mean, also the other thing, too, is is that Caleb McGarry, he really improved over the last couple of years, and that solidified the offensive line. So they actually have one of the more underrated offensive lines in football. I think one of the things that they definitely need, though, uh, is uh, really more on defense. Uh, once, of course, we talk uh, – because once they made the decision to go with Kirk Cousins, they basically made that decision that we're not going to the draft. We're going with uh, with Cousins for the next few years. I think that probably they might, sort of like the Jets. I think they're going to go into, like, the middle rounds and probably grab a quarterback, a young quarterback to the roster. Um, I think that would make that room perfect. You'd have your veteran backup, your starting quarterback, and your project to work on for a couple of years. But that's not something we're going to talk about right now. I think that they need somebody to line up opposite Jesse Bates at safety. That's that's something they're going to take care of a little bit later on in the draft. But here, um, and they have to decide at nickel, which I also think is a little early here. Um, uh, but here's the thing, is that they also desperately need an edge rusher. And... Um, and I know there have been a lot of uh, people of, that I've spoken to. I'm gonna, by the way, I'm gonna pop up your edge rusher, and, and I yep. did pop up the fact that you had Fashano as your number one tackle on the board, which maybe not yep. a lot of people uh, thought about uh, that that would be the case. But if we look at, at your edge rushers now, Latu. The thing with Latu, of course, that everybody's thinking about are his medicals. And yeah. I think that is definitely going to move him down the, the draft, in my opinion. I, I, I don't think they're going to take a chance on him uh, early. He could end up the best edge rusher in the class. Um, the other player that seems to be moving up a little bit is Dallas Turner. And I'm at a, I, I don't know why, other than just, I don't know. Is it Alabama? Is it the, the, the allure? Of 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 uh, of what maybe even Turner what they thought he was going to be at Alabama, but I don't think we ever saw that at Alabama. So, matter of fact, you have verse fourth. A lot of people believe that verse could be a top twelve or top fourteen pick. Um, so, I guess the question here then is, I think Atlanta would love to take an edge rusher, and if Latu didn't have medicals, I think he would be the clear go here then for yeah. for them. Um, but because of that, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just having a hard time believing that they would take Dallas Turner at, at eight, even though that's what I think a lot of people are thinking about if they go edge rusher here. Do you agree? Yeah, it, I, I think this spot is primed for an edge rusher, and Raheem Morris does drop his edge rushers into coverage more than your traditional defensive coordinator you know i mean you're not going to draft a guy here to drop back in coverage i know but i'm just trying to envision what kind of skill set are these guys going to look for if they pursue edge and to me dallas turner dropped back into coverage three times more than any of these guys okay in 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 the top six so that kind of like if they go edge rusher i think it's a no doubt dallas turner but the position that i think they could use equal amount of help and i think raheem morris would lean in this direction is corner and you have to ask yourself does Kenyon Mitchell who's a very toolsy corner but he's coming from Toledo he's coming from the Mac you know is is that someone that Raheem Morris can really get behind um you know so it it, to me this is another trade out opportunity I think yeah I agree uh, agree. because you might have a couple of teams being like hey JJ's still there JJ's still there coming up if we don't trade in front of them they're gonna get them Like, like that's that's where I think Atlanta could probably maybe get a future pick or just accrue some extra capital for this group because who they want here is probably going to be available or his equal will be available 
a few picks later. All right, but I'm, we got to pick. We got to make a pick. Yeah, and I'm going to go ahead. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and um, and, and uh, put Turner here, Dallas Turner. Okay. I, I think it's yeah, a logical bad. way to go. Uh, yep. But I, I do agree with you that I believe that uh, the way it's working out for us, uh, I could we could definitely see Atlanta trading out of this spot uh, if McCarthy is still available on the clock. So yeah, so that'll be uh, and that'll wrap up our first uh, our first um, quarter of the draft, putting Dallas Turner in there. Okay, so uh, next up. It's your it's your turn. Yep, we're back to Chicago, uh, a team that I've been on the radio with uh, Molly and Hall in Chicago several times over the past few months, and you know this pick comes up more than the first pick, obviously, because we already know it's going to happen at pick one. But it's this can go in two directions. One of them can be this entire offseason has been about hey, build the support system for our future quarterback, aka Caleb Williams. They've added receivers, they've changed up the offensive line, they've added a running back. Now, this is one of the best situations to ever put a rookie quarterback into. Um, and now, now I, I wrestle with two things here. Number one, uh, do you build up the defense so he doesn't have to chase points again like he did at USC, which that's when Caleb Williams, the worst in him comes out, yep. is that he tries to be Superman. He puts that cape on and kind of loses track of how to play the quarterback position. Um, so you can make – there is a there is a spot in my opinion for an edge rusher. You know, Demarcus Walker Absolutely. would be a great number three. Dominique Robinson is a great great guy to have off the bench. They got Montez Sweat. Um, then you know the other side of me says they've already put resources into the defensive line. Multiple day two picks last year inside. They trade a second rounder for Montez Sweat. They re-signed Demarcus Walker. You know, it, it, at some point they need an upgrade you know, though. Right at, at, on the other side at defensive end though. They absolutely. Yeah. So. And, and what's what works best with the scheme that they're trying to put into? Like, what's a good complement to what they have? And I come down to um, Latu, or because he's more of a skilled, skillful rusher, technique guy, can beat one on one blockers a lot of different ways. Or they go for the physical freak in Jared Verse. Uh, and there's, I love Jared Verse in the power game. I like rushers that have a power element to their game. But then I'm sitting here and I'm looking at Romo Dunze oh, and the yeah. fact that they still have Tyler Scott. That's starting he's not ready. Receiver. No, he's not ready. And I think Tyler Scott is a deep threat that you just give a couple deep balls uh, to per game, and and you and you hope hope it works out. I don't and think Keenan he's a guy Allen's that's getting older, and he might only be a one year rental, and he's a slot only. So who's playing outside? Nobody. I, I'm gonna, Maybe Roma Dunze. I'm going to go with Roma Dunze with okay. this pick, and it, it really kind of sets up Caleb with every single kind of weapon this kid needs, both for the short term and long term. And I think Roman Dunze, is, he's a safe personality. He's, he's not a diva like some of these wide. And you don't want to have Caleb Williams come in and, and kind of set up this diva type uh, mentality and culture. You want to get some of these guys in here. And I think the combination of Odunze, who's his age, and Keenan Allen, who's going to be a mentor, it's just a really good setup. And I think that's the theme of the Bears offseason so far, and I'm just going to add to it. Yeah, uh, I think you hit on all the guys I had. It was either offensive tackle – Maybe, but I think because of the, I think because the, the top two guys are out. I'm not so sure that's something. Plus, we don't know what they think about Braxton Jones. He's done a good job, uh, but we don't know whether or not they believe that they still need to kind of upgrade that position. But why would you have? Why why would you feel that when you have other big needs like you said, like a Dunze's on the board or Verse, um, or maybe even Latu? So uh, I'm 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 with you on all of those. And, uh, yeah, why not uh, take a player like Odunze, especially as we just talked about with what they need at wide receiver? That could be really scary. Uh, you know, you have your young quarterback being able to throw the football to Keenan Allen, Roman Dunze, and DJ Moore. So, yeah, that'd be pretty that's, nice. that's a great situation for him. Yeah. All right, you're up with the Jets now. All right. So, basically, it's just all about uh, checking to see who's available for me. So, by the way, McCarthy, of course, still on the board. I think the Jets should trade down by the way, uh, if they can. And if McCarthy's still on the board, I think they need to uh, uh, think about doing that. And I, I say that because I think they should be – I think they need to recoup the second-round pick, and I think they need to add a young quarterback in the room. Um, yeah. So, uh, But that would be like a second-rounder. They don't have that right now. So I think the right. Jets could definitely do that. There's a lot of talk about Brock Bowers here. I just think that, that that's just overkill. I, I don't see how they need Brock Bowers. Would I like to have him? Of course. Who wouldn't want to have Brock Bowers? But it's overkill. 
they, they don't need him. They need other positions like offensive line, um, especially. And I know, you know, everybody's looking at the offensive line in general, and they've made some nice improvements. But the offensive line, that those are one-year guys. And there's just no way that uh, Joe Douglas is going to risk what happened last year with injuries. And then he's got to go all of a sudden. You're looking at Max Mitchell and Carter Warren. He's just bookend tackles. Uh, he's just not doing it. So he's picking a tackle here if he doesn't trade down. Uh, who's left on our board at tackle? Latham. Um, you, yeah, Mims. you have Latham, Mims, uh, Fautanu. You have uh, Fulaga, T- Tyler Guyton. By the way, yeah, let's just put it this way. There's no left. way he's taking Mims because that'll be too much of a risk. Yep. Uh, That's a Mekhi Becton kind of like part two. Yes. You know, he's probably scarred from that. So um, now you talked about on the uh, on one of the shows, I think it was our mock draft show, you talked about F- Fatano, didn't you, because yeah. of his versatility? He's one of my top 10 players on my board overall. Uh, I just put it together a top 150 for USA Today, and that's where that's that's where I put positional value into the grades. So, you know, a guy with the same grade, a tackle with the same grade as a center, the tackle wins out by a lot. Yeah, um, there it is right there. And Altano, he, he ended up as my number nine overall player uh, on my board, and I love him for the Jets because he gives you another Elijah Vera Tucker type where he can he literally – Incredibly can project a guard and tackle at the next level. And with what the Jets did this offseason at tackle, I like and respect what respect it, but you need to start making plans for what you're going to do when Tyron Smith goes down. Because yep. there's one guarantee to his game, he's not going to last all year. Yep. So what's the plan? Don't, don't figure it out like they have, you know, last second. You know, and this is a guy that gives them a lot of options. Well, look, well, they are high on Carter Warren, but yeah, I think okay. you have to look at 2025 as all right, who are your bookends. All right, well, right. I think they want Carter Warren at right tackle and okay. this pick at left tackle. Got it. So that's that's what I think that they're looking at. Yeah, it's sense. a no brainer. Uh, in my in my book, I, I'd be shocked if there's a, cor- a credible offensive tackle on the board and he goes with Brock Bowers. I would just be completely shocked. Um, <laughs> Even though I, I, you know, again as a fan, you're you'd be excited about it, but I, I just I can't see it. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Minnesota, right? So they don't even have to trade up, do they? If they if they yeah. want McCarthy, it's possible. You know, all this talk about these guys trading up. I mean, we're not doing trades in this mock. Do I? You know, if you put a gun to my head, yes, I think there's going to be a trade up at some point for for the fourth quarterback taken, whether it's Drake May or JJ McCarthy. But you know. The draft might come to whoever wants J.J. McCarthy. You might not have to trade up for him. Um, he's just he's a really interesting case. I think there's, just like in the media, there's going to be a lot of love and hate for him. There's going to be some guys who say, hey, we, we can't put our eggs in this basket. You know, A, with a pick, and B, with trading future picks. Uh, but if he comes to us and we don't feel pressure to put him on the field, which they won't because they signed, they signed Darnold, so he'll at least start the year for them. Um, and then they get they get their 21 year old quarterback of the future type. Um, so I am definitely going to go with um, with JJ McCarthy here at 11. Pretty pretty easy decision. You went Fatano for the Jets. I just want to make sure. Yes, I did. Okay. So all right, let's just say all quarterbacks are off. Yep. Give me another uh, pick for Minnesota. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, they need they need some interior offensive line help. If fautanu has gone, you know he he's out. But you know, J.C. Latham, T- Talise Fawaga, they can project inside. And they, you know, they probably would rather wait until later on. I think they could use a, a true number one corner. I like their cornerback yes. room. I think there's a lot of young talent there, but I don't think any of them project to be a number one. So I would probably go with the the cornerback one in this class and go with Kenyon Mitchell. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yep. And they also could use. Um... Uh, uh, a little bit more inside at defensive tackle. But, yeah, yeah, corner staring you right in the face. And I think it's an obvious uh, move if they don't uh, have a quarterback. Okay. Uh, Denver is next. And this is another team that everybody is talking about, uh, quarterback. Um, and, you know, is this uh, – see, this, this is why it's going to be interesting, especially with Denver, because – we only have the experience with um, with Peyton once. Mm-hmm. That's it. And right. you know he, he, they made the move and they were able to get uh, Breeze, but that's it. We, we don't have a lot of other experience on, on on what he wants to do with the quarterback position. But you just still have to believe that 
even if the top four quarterbacks were gone, I just think it'd be... I can't see him not taking a quarterback. And I think he's already deciding, okay, what do I do? Do we trade up? If we don't trade up big, um, and especially you get these guys too, like um, Peyton, that their, their ego. Yep. I can do this. I can elevate yep. this guy. I don't need one of those top three guys. I can I can figure out a way with McCarthy or Nix or Penix. I can make it work with one of them. And I can't, I can't believe that he wouldn't say that to himself. So the question then would lie if we don't make a trade and we sit here and it's Knicks and Penix. To me, I think it's Knicks just because of the fact that you do have some injury concerns with Penix. I like the fact that they're both experienced. Um, that's great for the future. But I do think Knicks is the better prospect, and that's why I'm going to put him here. I like it. I agree with it. Uh, Bo Nix is... He, he's a guy that I think fits in with Sean Payton really well, too, um, physically and mentally. You know, uh, okay. Sean Payton is a big hand size guy. Um, I was told that by a guy that was around him in his early days of coaching uh, with the Giants and the Cowboys, that it's it's something he almost will obsess about in the evaluation process. And Bo Nix, and it's not just, um, you know, it's not just semantics. It's, it's he really believes in pump fakes. So, I mean, Drew Brees took his game to another level when Sean Payton really taught him how to take advantage of pump fakes and you can it's a lot easier to do that especially in, in bad weather uh, when you can really wrap your fingers around that ball i mean drew Brees, 10 and a half inch hands russell wilson 10 and a half inch hands these are guys that he just recently has associated with jj mccarthy nine inch hands that's that's bottom rung uh if you go measure all these guys in the nfl and you know bo nix has that big size i also think he can take hard coaching really experienced he's the son of a coach a legendary high school coach um and he's been around the block. He's been through a lot of adversity, a lot of high pressure situations. And Sean Payton himself says he is not an easy guy to play for if you're a quarterback. Like you have to have some thick skin. And we've seen this with quarterbacks coming out of college all the time. They can't handle it. Can't handle the physical pressure, can't handle the mental and emotional pressure. True. And Bo Nix to me is gonna be, you know, there are issues I have with him physically, but mentally I think he's gonna be dialed in. He'll be on that straight line, won't get too high, won't get too low. So, you know, Denver, the fact that they haven't made any aggressive moves in free agency this year at quarterback, I mean, it just, it seems, and they don't really have a ton of capital to trade up with. I think they know, and they've known for a while, they're just going to sit tight and know that no one's going to hop in front of them to take Bo Nix. And uh, that they're just going to sit tight and take yeah. that guy and run him into the future. Yeah. And uh, they did a lot of shuffling to open up uh, cap space, which yep. they needed. You know, getting rid of uh, trading and getting rid of guys and uh so yeah i mean that's another th another thing to keep an eye on is whether or not uh is is there's a team out there that wants to trade up doesn't need a quarterback but they want to trade out hey you know what the number one corners on the board or such and such edge rushers on the board or such and such tackle we want all right we'll move down two or three spots because we still think we'll get bo Nix. So yeah. I wouldn't. So let's keep because Denver needs more talent. They, they could definitely use, even though I believe they have a good um, amount of picks overall. Um, I forget the number, but they do have a good uh, uh, they, uh, nine total picks. But let's keep in mind they do not have a second rounder. Um, so six of those nine are after the fifth round. So Denver is definitely a trade out candidate. But the question would then be, uh, how far? Okay, Vegas is next. Yeah, Vegas to me, you know, it. I don't think they're going quarterback here. And it's a little rich for the risky Michael Penix. I mean, they have a two-year deal with Gardner Minshew. I, Aiden O'Connell with his coaching staff went 500 last year. And, you know, it's, you know, we're seeing the success of Brock Birdie. I do think that has a trickle-down effect to some of these teams saying, like, hey, let's give this kid a shot. Let's build, let's, let, let, build it around him and see if we can – you know, get an immense value of paying a day three rookie uh, for a few years as we build the rest of the roster. You know, they get aggressive with Christian Wilkins and the defensive line. That's a great one-two punch with Max Crosby, and hopefully Tyree Wilson can blossom in year two after being a top 10 pick in 2023. Um, you know, I'm going to lean towards corner here. I think they're really vulnerable at that spot with Jack Jones, who is a playmaker, uh, but, you know, he's been into some trouble off the field at Arizona State when Antonio Pierce was there, by the way. And in New England, he got cut last year because of it. Uh, Jacorian Bennett um, was drafted because he ran a fast forty last year. Um, he he got beat up pretty bad as a rookie, and which is fine. I'm not yeah, they, yeah, they like him. Yeah, they still like but him. But I, 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 
that's this is another team similar to Minnesota. They need a number one guy, yep. or at least a guy that they think can be number one. I love Nate Hobbs at nickel. I think that's where he does his best work. But I think you bring in Quinion Mitchell, and even if he's not ready to jump from Toledo to the NFL, you know, you have a couple of guys that can hold the fort for a half a season and, and let this guy get 15, 20 snaps a game. And if he responds well, then, hey, maybe you start developing into your true cornerback one in a division where – it's they, they, you have to have a good pass defense. You're, you're never going to get past the Chiefs if, if you can't stop the pass. So, you know, I'm leaning pass rusher or corner here. And I think with the value of Kenyon Mitchell staring them in the eyes, a true outside guy, a dude that checked every box from season, combine, senior bowl, um, pr- pretty pretty confident this, this is going to be the choice if he ends up being there. Yeah, I like it. Now, the, the, uh, do you think he is the consensus number one corner? No, I, I don't think he's consensus. Um, I think it's going to be split between him and, and Arnold. I just, you know, cornerback, like you don't want to get too into measurables and speed, but corner is a position where it matters, you know, what you run. And it, the size that he also brings to the table, the ball skills, I mean, he did everything, you know, that that, that a guy like this needs to be. We have not seen a first corner taken in a draft outside of the Power Five conferences since 2008. Um, it was Leotis McKelvin from Troy who went to Buffalo. And so this that that's what gives me pause is, hey, this guy played against the Mac receivers. Like, do we really know he can hang with NFL speed? Uh, he did it the senior bowl, but it was really it was for a day. What know, about he, Telesco? He past- Does he what who? about his uh, Telesco's uh, draft history? Does his draft yeah, history? I, I looked into his draft history. There was a lot of trenches, a lot of offensive to defensive lines. I think half of his picks were offense defensive line um, in, in round one, since uh, other than the Justin Herbert year. Uh, defensive back was twice over that span. One was a corner, one was Derwin James. Okay. I, he likes, he, he does value tools. And if you're asking me who has the best tools, among corners, it's it's Quinion Mitchell, and it's honestly it's not even that close. He's by far the I agree. the tool for his corner of the group. Yeah, group. I agree. I think he should be number one too. But you, like you said, a lot's going to depend on the general manager and if he's okay with going with that non uh, power five guy. Okay, yep. especially when they got the number one uh, power five guy also on the board. Um, so yeah, but it should be. You would think if 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 the, if the top corners are, you would think it would be down to Arnold or Mitchell. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Arnold, you know, what Arnold gives them that Mitchell doesn't is a little bit more versatility, uh, plays the nickel, can play outside. He can even play safety in some looks. So if that's what they want, which I don't think that's what they want, because they, they invested in the safety position last year. They have a couple good guys. They have Hobbs to play the nickel. That's why I think they want, like, a true bona fide outside dude. All right, the Saints are next. And... Uh, the Saints could definitely. There's a couple of needs on offense. They need a wide receiver. Uh, they need an offensive guard. But we're not going to worry about the guard situation just yet. Uh, wide receiver is a definite need. They also have to get better in the interior on defense. Now they did it last year with Br- with Brzee, uh, yep. but they could still they need another one, somebody else. So uh, uh, we're going to look there. We also we just took a corner, and this is going to be another corner situation here potentially. Um, because I'm not sure that uh, – see, I don't know what they think about Taylor. I know they drafted him. He was a second-round pick. I, they're probably going to give him time. So I don't think that they're going to just necessarily uh, pass over on him. But overall depth anyway would make a uh, smart move. A lot of more is getting up there in age. So I think a corner added to the team. So I think those are the top three early – I mean, as far as when we're looking at the draft board right now. Um, so I'm going to take a look at yours – as a matter of fact, let me pop that up there while I do that. And so I think if it's defensive tackle, uh, you've got uh, – so. Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little surprised you've got the kid from Clemson as your top guy. Yeah, that was – that honestly surprised me as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, but but I put my – you know, I put my grading – I try not to go based on feel. You know, it's – you know, I have an equation, a little algorithm that I want to put all these factors in, production, health, length, uh speed pass rush capability pressure rate and you know if you're looking for just a pass rusher newton and murphy are definitely one and one a you know those guys are better pass rushers than than rook but rook is more of an every down threat won't be a liability against the run and i think he's a little underrated as a pass rusher i think he's got more tools to work with that we just haven't seen yet because of the role that they had him play next to tyler davis at clemson um 
you know, I've talked to a couple of ACC linemen over the past couple of years. Whenever I get to talk to these guys, I always ask, who's the best player or the toughest player you've ever had to play against? And his name came up more often than anyone okay. from the ACC. I, I think he's going to be a better pro than college player. Uh, how high, let's just say Newton ends up being the number one defensive tackle. How high do you yeah. see Newton going? Top 20. I, I think interior pass rushers are just becoming more and more in demand. Um, you could even just see with the contracts some of these guys are getting now. Um, that it's almost catching up to, to edge rushers. It's not quite there yet, but you know, if you get it, I think Aaron Donald really has changed the game. A, the average defensive tackle is about 10 to 15 pounds lighter than they were even 10 years ago. Okay. Um, and B, I think the value of what a guy can do as an interior pass rusher, uh, to me, it's always been important, but now I think the league is actually saying, hey, if we can't get the dogs on the outside, let, let's go after these guys inside. And there are so many interior pass rushers in this class that you can't go wrong with, with either one of these top two, Newton and Murphy. I do not think that uh, even though they definitely have to add a wide receiver, it would be too early for Brian Thomas. So I'm going to go ahead and do the smart thing on the board uh, because they need a corner. And I'm mm. going to go ahead and take a corner. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, put Arnold here uh, for Ale for uh, New Orleans. I like it, I, and I like it because he his best role, I think, at the next level is going to be nickel, and that's what they need the most in their defensive and, and the secondary. Um, you know, I don't think Elante Taylor is going to work out there. You know, he's either got to play outside corner or safety, and I think Arnold gives him that that immediate contributor with a really high upside. Okay, you are up next. We are at uh, pick uh, number 15 with the Colts. So a couple different directions here. Um, you know, this is a front office that values the freak athlete, um, I think more than any team in the NFL, if you, if you look at trends of who they've drafted, no matter what position, it's almost always just a freak, a freak of nature. They almost maybe even overvalue some workout scores. But if you're going to miss, miss fast. And, and I think that's kind of where they, they fall in line. Like they have some prerequisites in their draft room that if they don't, have, if a certain guy doesn't have a certain threshold, they won't even have him on their draft board. Uh, and then you look at some of these past things that they've done, and, and it's worked out and more often than not. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be a, a pass catcher, and I'm torn between three guys. One of them is my next available wide receiver, Brian Thomas. So you do think had, Thomas could go this high? I do think he could. I think him and like I'll say it now, he's not my fifth-ranked great receiver, but Adonai Mitchell from Texas. When you're talking about freaks with size, yeah. weight, speed, leaping ability, yeah, I think he's a first-round you know, guy. Yeah. He, he's I think he's going higher than everyone thinks um, he is a little bit of a diva type doesn't run hard routes he even is open about it he'll tell the media that he didn't run a route hard because he knew it wasn't coming his way you know he doesn't block he doesn't do anything after the catch he's one of the worst guys after the catch so you know I don't know if that's a culture for for Indianapolis so I come down but I'm, I also have Joe uh, Brock Bowers staring me in the eyes right now because you know as much as this team this front office will talk he's up still on the great, board He's still there, uh, and I do think 15 is the floor for him. I just can't see him. He's he's got to be one of the top five players in this draft if yeah. you're not including uh, value of, of, of position. And the, the, what gives me hesitation is he's a slot, and they have a slot. They drafted Josh Downs last year. He, you're not putting him outside. So can you get both of these guys on the field enough to justify using Brock Bowers true. as, as a uh, 15th overall pick yeah, while you're still – trotting out Alec Pierce as a, as a starting wide receiver. And and they really, what they need is they need Pittman to be the two. They need the yeah. one. They don't have yeah. really the number one wide receiver. So if you believe Brian Thomas is a number one uh, guy, then yeah, I, I see what you're saying. But uh, man, if Bowers is sitting here, it is going to be awfully tough for Indianapolis to pass on him either. So yeah, they got to have some tough decisions. And plus, they also need corners. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, this would be a very tough decision because they, they, they have cornerback issues. Um, they got safety issues that I'm sure – well, at least one safety issue that they'll worry about later on, I would guess, unless they want to pick a guy like Cooper DeGene. Um, but, yeah, the, yeah, and they also could use another edge guy. But, yeah, it's going to be tough. Bowers, Thomas, uh, corner. So I, I, cir I circle back to, you know, are, are we supporting our franchise quarterback that we used – uh, a top five pick on last year and Anthony Richardson. What can we do to make his life better? And that's why I'm going to stick with the receiver okay. and assume that they, they can, you know, go to war with these tight ends that they already have in the room. Um, because Brock Bowers, as good as he is, he's not toolsy. He's just, he's a great football player. 
And I think I think Ballard will choose tools over good football players, and that's going to be Brian Thomas Jr., wide receiver from LSU. Yeah, it's uh, it is very interesting because I was I was talking to uh, uh, Kent Sterling, who does the Colts uh, for us, and he did bring that up about well, you know, but, but if Bowers were to last, but I don't see that happening. But if he were to last, so it is. And it's like wow, he he's there. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, that's why I'm saying it'd be awfully tough for them to, to say no. But um, uh, yeah, they need a number one receiver. Yeah, it's, uh, that's definite. Okay, uh, next up is Seattle. We'll wrap up uh, the first half of the draft here, uh, and uh, of course they have a new a new head coach right now. So um, uh, got to keep an eye on that. Uh, th- this one actually, I gotta say, um, it it, it kind of looks. Uh, I mean, it does kind of look simple for me. Uh, I'm sure there's be a lot of Seahawk fans are probably hoping that this works out, but I think it, I I don't know what the Sam Howell move though does um, because Michael Penix really you would think is the perfect fit here. Uh, I mean, especially when the offensive coordinator <laughs> came from Washington. I just can't imagine that they would pass on that situation. So uh, I'm going to take Penix, but go ahead and talk about if they don't go quarterback, what other yeah. possibilities that they would go. Yeah. Um, I love the edge rusher. I love Jared Verse and Latu giving them the choice of do you take the physical freak or do you take the highly skilled pass rusher? And part of that depends on what they already have in the room. Either one of them would be great picks, great value picks for this team and the actual situation that they're in. Um you know, they just signed Lakin Tomlinson, which, who I know that you know pretty well. I don't know if that's a long-term answer at guard. Um, you know, there's a couple offensive linemen on the table that I think could just add a little bit of competition and depth to the room. Um, you know, they used one on a wide receiver last year. I don't think they go in that direction. Um, you know, I, I do think it would be on the defensive side of the ball unless they go quarterback. So it comes back down to the edge rusher, and I, I don't think there's much else that is even in consideration. You know, I like Byron Murphy on this team as well. So you could even just say as a compliment, as a as a pass rusher, you know, that might be what they need to do if they don't go penance. This is like, hey, let's take our top available pass rusher. And that that's where they that's it could be Byron Murphy, Jared Verse, Leia, Tulatu. Okay. Um, that that's where I think they go if they don't go quarterback. All right. So Jacksonville is next as we set to the second half of our draft. And um by the way, the other thing is this is keep in mind because of the fact that Seattle's pr- might be saying to themselves, we're going to take Penix or we want to take him, but maybe we shouldn't take him this early. Let's trade down. We don't have a right. second round draft pick. Let's try to recoup some draft capital. We'll take Penix anyway, as long as they feel confident they can get him by going down a few spots. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Yep. Uh, next up is Jacksonville. So these guys have put themselves in a really good position um, in terms of just filling a few holes in free agency that they can go into this draft and be like, hey, whoever the best guy is, let's just, let's just grab him. Let's bring him into town. Okay. Um, you know, they, they added defensive line town with Eric Armstead. Um, they they re-signed uh, Josh Allen, their, their star pass rusher on the outside. They added two starters in the defensive backfield at offensive line wide receiver i mean across the board they just raised the floor of this entire team and this is how in my opinion you try and do it you go into draft weekend and say hey who's the standout great on our board and that's what i'm going to do here uh with this pick i mean who's the best available player um on either side of the ball and it's going to come down to a pass rushing inside guy um, which I think they need to complement the other bodies that they have. Davon Hamilton's a non-factor. Eric Armstead is starting to lose it a little bit. So I'm actually going to go with Jerzon Newton here, the pass rusher from Illinois uh, Ooh, inside. Like a couple tough calls there. You know, Cooper DeGene's an option because of the versatility he can bring on the back end. Um, lot two and verse, you know, it's surprising me they're still there, but this happens every year in the draft where you see guys that you just didn't think were going to fall end up falling. And, and Bowers is, so I and, think and that Bowers is still down. falling too for a tight end. So yeah. Guys I mean, are falling. Evan Engram, Evan Engram has found a home in Jacksonville. He's producing at a high level. He's got a good oh, yeah. relationship with Bowers. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, you know, it's Bowers is a really good player. Might even be the best player available, but 
you know, their, their stocks at tight end. It would kind of be a waste of a resource sure. while neglecting the pass rush, which Jerzon Newton will help out right away. And again, when you have guys slipping like Brock Bowers and so forth, they're going to, like we just talked about Seattle, maybe one in the trade down. Well, there you go. Maybe a team, oh, Bowers is still available. Let me go get him with Seattle. Seattle moves down a couple spots. So, yep. and maybe we'll, you know, look, Cincinnati, you would think, well, there you go. They need a tight end, but that's just not part of their offense. They, they yep. just they don't care. Now, who knows? Maybe this is the draft. Maybe they go, well, well we've never had Brock Bauer sitting in front of us. <laughs> so, because yep. he is. He's still there. Uh, taking a look at what uh, Cincinnati um, uh, needs to do, they definitely need a slot upgrade. Uh, of course, a lot's going to depend on uh, Charlie Jones, but still. And again, we also think T. Higgins could get traded, so there's going to be a lot of talk there about that. They could good move picking up the two wide receivers last year in the draft, um, but they can still use add another wide receiver. Um, they have uh, uh, they, they they have Trent Brown now, which was uh, uh, you know a big addition um, to go along with Orlando Brown. So I think that helps them out. It doesn't mean that they won't add a right tackle at some point. So and I think that they'll also add. Um, uh, I don't know who would be like a real like if they were going to take a right tackle with their first pick. Who is the most athletic right tackle available? I'm Amaris Mims, really. I mean, okay. this is a spot where I think I think it makes a lot of sense because he kind of fits the mold of a Trent Brown, Orlando Brown, just like size, power, and you know the things you don't know about Mims yet. It's like you don't have to play him right away, which is what I think. Cincinnati go. is pretty traditional in that regard. Like they don't mind sitting a rookie for an entire year or half a year. Um, they didn't bring Trent Brown in to back up a rookie, so he'll be the starter week yeah. one. And if he holds on to his job, you know, you just have extra depth for a guy that needs a little bit more developing than your traditional right tackle that can be a first round projection. So, you know, JC Latham's a nice kind of like, you know, secondary option. Fuaga, a nice, you know, third option there. But if you're going for upside and, hey, perfect situation for the player, it's a Mary Smith's. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, again, look, I think it would be uh, – I think I think if Bowers was still on the board, Bengal fans and everybody would be targeting the Bowers to the Bengals. It's going to happen. But it just does make sense just knowing this offense that that's just – they don't care about tight end as much. And it's more important that they get somebody on offensive line uh, because they, they, they have to learn their lesson sooner or later. Um, yep. And if they go through another draft and don't – spend a first round draft pick on a tackle and bolster that room they're going to be in trouble so um that's why i'm sticking uh with uh, with the mims idea especially because he could develop with trent brown um starting this year okay uh you're up next with the rams i'm gonna go fun here this is this gets me excited that this could even happen <laughs> and fits the offense like a glove you're not gonna say brock bowers are you i am going to say brock bowers <laughs> <tight end. laughs> because this just gives them just, I mean, there isn't a quarterback, there is not an offensive mind, maybe other than Shanahan, that I would want Bowers to get associated with just for the long term. Um, Higby is the kind of guy that, you know, he's serviceable, hasn't been the same since his injury, who knows how much longer he has. You know, even if he does stick around for another year or two, you're gonna find usage for him. I mean, look what Puka Nakua did. I mean, it's funny, these guys are similar football players. You get them and Cooper Cup, how do you defend that on, on third and six where games are won and lost? And the creativity that Georgia had in using Brock Bowers since his freshman year, that carries over to what the Rams do. They're going to get this guy's carries and jet sweeps and line them out wide, line them up in the backfield. Um, I think he's an immediate superstar in that offense and gives them something to really stand on for the long-term future. So. Now, a little bit of a curveball, uh, but but I like I like throwing at least a curveball or two in, into a mock draft like this. Yeah, and I, I had uh, when I was talking about uh, them uh, about a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned the fact that I think that uh, I think that Les Need is the most underrated general manager in the game. Yeah, I could not believe when I did the homework. Uh, that he has never been an executive of the year. Uh, oh wow! I, I, didn't I, know just, I mean, Brandon Bean is his executive of the year twice, and you, you you're not given. Uh, um, uh, this past season was one of the most impressive I've ever seen out of the Rams, and they they didn't win at all. But like, I remember going over their roster with you, and it was just like half their roster was rookies and day three picks. 
and they 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 performed so well last year. I was really impressed, and that was off to me. That was off front office. Yeah, I I I, I remember last year we we talked about it uh, as far as the uh, the because at this time last year it was a mess. Yep. The, the, and they made the playoffs with, with that roster. Yep. All right. So Pittsburgh is up, and um, look, the Steelers did it. it an incredible job. Uh, we mentioned it on our on our live draft about the changes that just don't happen in one off season, and that is a quarterback. And it's just amazing that they've completely uh, changed the room. Um, and it's also it was also amazing that they made the playoffs last year. But it shows you what a very well coached and a, and a great organization they are. That's the reason that they made the playoffs last year. Um, they kind of backdoored in a, in a way because other teams had quarterback injuries and such, but still it just shows you that that's why if you're always in around 500, like they are, you can backdoor a few times. Uh, as far as what they're going to need, um, I think defensively, I think they definitely have to do something as far as that nickel. That's just a wide open, definite hundred percent need uh, on offense. Uh, I, I don't know what they think overall um, uh, 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 about Dan Moore, but I've heard that they're satisfied with him. As much as he just doesn't seem to wow anybody, they seem to like yeah. him. Okay, but they, they definitely need a center, and this is where uh, I don't know if uh, Powers, I don't know if uh, Powers Johnson goes this high, but he could. I've I've heard a lot about him interviewing people, um, so I think offensively, I think that is the, the 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 big one. But it's just too big of a of a issue though at nickel. Um, and I think that that is probably. I mean, if it, to me, if it's down to those two spots, like how high actually do you think uh, Powers Johnson is going to could go in the draft? I would say mid twenties. You know, I, I think this would be a little rich for him. But like I said, like they like Dan Moore. I don't like him, but I haven't liked him for a couple of years, and they they want to keep you know put him out there. So they, do. they just use they just use the first round pick uh, first round pick on tackle Bernard Jones last year. Yeah. So to me, it's like they're not going to go tackle again. That's just not what the Steelers do. They they kind of disperse their first round first round picks around and um but they still value the offensive line and i do think there's a weak point inside um on an offense that i think it was is going to be very run heavy especially if justin fields gets his hands on that job in the next year or two um and he he is by far the the, the top offensive lineman in, in 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 this draft yep week one starter gives you guard center versatility um you know it, it's by no means would i call this a reach do i think he's yeah. do, if if he doesn't go here, I'm going to consider him the next pick with Miami. So it's um, no, I, I wouldn't he, say it's too early at all. No, he's he's going to go here, and that's the reason. The reason is is because I think they could grab a nickel a little yeah. bit later on, and Absolutely. still get a quality nickel. Yep. So um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that, uh, and uh, why not? Uh, again, like I said, I've heard a lot about him in my interview process, and. Um, so he, he could definitely be the man that goes maybe a little bit early. All right, so uh, center, Jackson Powers Johnson, Oregon. You're up next with Miami. So Miami, I, can, I really can't see them adding a wide receiver town here because of what they do on offense uh, and just leaning into that leaning into that strength. And I'm not sure what the Jalen Waddell long-term future is there. Um, but the, the name that's sticking out to me right now, there's two of them, and it's um, – gonna be a tough call I, I like Cooper Jean here a nickel that could play safety corner outside even uh, but I also like Byron Murphy the pass rushing D tackle on a team that just lost Christian Wilkins and that guy's been you know their top or second best pass rusher inside for four or five years now and they they didn't do much in free agency to replace him um, when it comes to the actual pass rushes they've added some bodies there but they also lost Raekwon Davis so they're down two guys, and I just, they added a bunch of guys that I think are, are you know, reserves, second string, third string. So I'm going to go with my instinct on that and, and go with Byron Murphy, defensive tackle from Texas. All right. And uh, so what was your other option? It was going to be Cooper DeGene, the, the nickel from Iowa, um, or, or wide receiver, Xavier Worthy, um, Adonai Mitchell. Okay. Yeah, because we're at that point now in the draft where uh, – there's a lot of different options that you can go. Yeah. So we're yep. getting there. All right. Next up, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, the Eagles, boy, you look at their at their roster and you're like, how in the world are they 
struggled so much last year after yeah. we're almost winning the Super Bowl. But hey, you know, good teams have Super Bowl hangovers, and they had a hangover for sure. Uh, offensively, um, I, I think a, a lot of it's depth. I mean, they, they could add all over the place, really depth-wise on offense. I think they're really, uh, they're, they're, their main guys are set. Uh, you know, they could use maybe depth at running back, a tight end, uh, offensive tackle, wide receiver. They could use a number three wide receiver because Devontae Parker, Paris Campbell, okay, that's all right. But um, uh, that could just be one-year deals. But I think that, to me, the way the board is going, it's really worked out perfectly for Philadelphia once again. Um, so I'm going to ask you at this knowing because Fangio is the coordinator. He, uh, yeah, they added Bryce Huff, but they and, and they do have Sweat, but he wants edge rushers, edge rushers, and edge rushers. And because of the way it's worked out, there are edge rushers available on our board. So who do you think would fit perfectly here with this defense with our board? Man, I mean. Versus the tools guy that plays a little tight, a little bit of a raw guy, doesn't have a lot of variety to his game, which works against college kids. I don't know if it always translates to NFL blockers. Um, who, who, I love so, yeah, who would be more of a who? Yeah, is there somebody that doesn't have to have their hand in the dirt? Um, I mean, they, they do everything. I mean, a, a guy that I think could play behind Josh Sweat early on. I mean, they have Nolan Smith waiting in the wings as well. Um, so just considering the future and what these guys do, right? You, you bring in the slightly undersized Bryce Huff. You already have the slightly undersized Nolan Smith. You have Josh Sweat, who can play long, but I wouldn't call him a power defender. If there's one area I think this team is vulnerable, it's against the run. And that that's not, a, that's not an area you want to be vulnerable in the NFC East, especially and also during playoff football. You know, you need to be able to stop and run the ball. You know, as much as the game is changing, that's still a philosophy that I very much believe in. So they need somebody so, on the edge. Jared also, versus think is, Jared, Jared versus, versus Madden, I think can can set the edge, defend the run, but also add as a pass rusher. Yeah, that's the, what I think. the the other uh, position that I would look at uh, would be corner, um, yep. but uh, I think right now. Like I said, I'm just going to lean towards the fact that our board, because some of these guys like Verse could go early, much earlier. Latu is still on the board. So I just think it's time to add some more edge rushers uh, as far as our board is concerned. But I could definitely see a corner here as well. Okay, Minnesota gets their second pick at 23. So I'm looking at I'm looking at interior offensive line. Uh, I think there's three weak points there. Uh, Ed Ingram, Garrett Bradbury, and Br- Blake Brindell. Um, do, I, do I want to try and get J.C. Latham and convert him to guard. Um, they're set at tackle. So I, I don't know if he has the value there. I feel the same way about Fuaga, who is a good tackle. I think he could be better at guard. Graham Barton is a name from Duke who played left tackle. He was going to play center at the Senior Bowl, but an injury kind of kept him out of the week. I have him as my second best guard, or interior lineman, I should say, in this class. Um, do they want to go down that path? You know, Minnesota, their front office is just full of guys that come from that finance economics background. I don't think using a first round pick on an interior offensive lineman is is in the cards for them. They need a so corner go, too, don't they? So I go to positional value here and I, I think it comes down to a corner or a pass rusher. Pass Even rusher. Though they, yeah. you know, they they lo- they did leave uh, sorry, they did lose um daniel daniel hunter to houston but they brought back in jonathan grenard yeah and um andrew van ginkle so they, they have their starters there neither one of those guys are true number ones to me so it comes down to a corner or pass rusher yeah and it's a tough call i would you know, go corner do. but uh you know lot is still on the board though and he's starting lot- to now drop into that spot where okay you know it's great value yeah so um, that's a tough call that's it's your call i think the medicals i think the medicals are going to scare off minnesota f- from going lot to here so okay. i think it's going to err towards corner and now i'm i'm torn between the the toolsy nate wiggins well i shouldn't say toolsy i should say the fast nate wiggins because he's very light and he's not very long arms he doesn't play as big as his size would lead you to believe okay. or just the the safer kool-aid mckinstry you know i i feel safer with him on the field than Nate Wiggins, both run and pass, but I think he just knows the game better. He's got a better feel. 
he was big time talent in 2022 and 2023 they just didn't throw him in his direction so everyone's like oh the production's down he ran a four five which is pretty slow for an outside corner uh but I think the value of a corner stands out here, and I think they're going to err towards the guy that can do it right, and that's Kool-Aid McKinstry, corner from Alabama. All right, there you go. That uh, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, either way, just as we always talk about, there's going to be some good value as you start getting a little bit later on in the draft. It's just the nature. All right, Dallas is next. And the Cowboys take a look at their primary needs. I think there are uh, three to four of them myself. And I think right now um, I-, I would be looking at uh, linebacker. Uh, they did add Eric Kendricks, but that's, uh, that's not something that's going to be long term. And I, even though linebacker is a need, it's not one of those needs that you really worry about with this defense early. Um, offensive tackle uh, is, 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 you know, they, they lost a, a Smith to the Jets. Um, Tyler Smith now gets the opportunity to be the man. Uh, but uh, right tackle is still a big issue. Um, Steele's okay, but I think he's more serviceable as a swing. And then you have wide receiver and corner as well. Uh, Cooks is up there in age. Tolbert should be able to make a move, but, he, you know, that's still a question. And, uh, yeah, corner is also something that uh, I'd look at. Jordan Lewis, uh, he could be replaced at nickel. So I think you're looking at those spots. Um, let's see. So let's take a look at what's uh, what's on the board at corner. Uh, you, you talked about uh, Wiggins. Now, again, because it's the slot, I think that you could also, we talked about with this Pittsburgh, I think you could wait maybe to go with the slot a little bit later on. Um, I, I, as you know, I'm a big Sanders still guy. So yeah. I think you can get him in the second round, third round like that and, and love that all day long. If you're, I'll tell you what, I think there's going to be a lot of demand for him. Um, you know, every year, right the week of the draft, I come up with my five guys that could come out of nowhere and, and be the first round pick that no one saw coming. And he's one of my guys. Um, cool. I don't think there's a shot. He lasts around three. Um, I think he's a top 40 pick. So if you want him, it's, it's going to be top 40. You're not getting him. Yeah, I'm going to uh, – but I just, think the way, I just think the way that a board is, um, I, I, I think that – well, first of all, Brian Thomas is going to look really good. I think the Cowboys love, would love to get a guy like that. That's just – that's got Jerry Jones written all over him. But I think J.C. Latham has is, is lasted long enough. Yeah. And I think it's time to add him to, uh, to our draft. That's a logical pick. What do you think about him overall as a, as a player? I hated him in 2022, and I loved him in 2023. <laughs> it, it's okay. funny. He, he, I did a lot of summer scouting on him, and I was, I said third round pick, just based on his 2022 tape. Power guy, uh, because I said his hands are as strong as anyone in this class. I would even say his hands are the best. So when he locks you up, you're not going anywhere. Okay. But I just saw some adjustment issues. Reactive athletic is, uh, athletic ability was not there, but he improved a lot, and that's that's what you want. I do fear the Alabama tackle sometimes. Maybe Evan Neal is still kind of sticking to me. Uh, but I know this, <laughs> that this is, this is a thought around the league too, that some of these really sophisticated, professional caliber programs in college, they get these guys to top out in college. They don't get better because they're so sophisticated. Nutrition, training, coaching. I mean, we have NFL coaches on the Alabama staff every year. It's like a revolving door. It's like a transition year for guys in between jobs in the NFL that once they get to the NFL, there's just not much left to get. So who J.C. Latham is right now is, is who he is going to be in five years. Is that good enough for NFL? That's that's the question that you're going to have with a guy from Alabama. I love him as a run blocker. I love him that if he has his feet underneath him and he's not extending, overextending, if he gets his hands on, it's over. So as a right tackle, I feel good about that. Um, and compared to what they need right now, you know, I don't want to see Terrence Steele and, and Matt Wallet let's Matt will let's go protecting my quarterback. So I like the pick. I think it's good value and I think it's a good need as well. All right. You are up next with the Packers, our final quarter of the draft. So we have to uh, boogie here. I am looking at two guys, Cooper DeGean, oh, yeah. who who gives them a, a really versatile defensive back. Even though I know Xavier McKinney came in this year, I still think they need a nickel. Yep. And 
Cooper DeGene kind oh, of reminds me of Brian Branch. Yeah. You know, yeah. he, he's like, he's really is a blend of a nickel, a, a corner and a safety. Um, he just tested. He had his pro day last week, did really well. So that kind of checked that box. So I'm going to go Cooper DeGene here to kind of replace what they thought they had in Darnell Savage and gives them a really nice new addition to that defensive backfield with uh, Xavier McKinney. Yeah, I think he's awesome here because they need um, they need multiple DBs and he fits perfectly into that kind of need situation. So yeah, that'd be great. Okay, Tampa Bay, I've got the Bucks next and uh, take the Bucks of course had themselves an excellent year last year nobody was expecting. Um, uh, defensively, uh, wow, Latu is here. I think I'm going to take Latu. I'm not going to waste much time. Uh, I think they need an edge guy like Latu. I think they also uh, have to look at, uh, at some point, they're going to add an inside linebacker on defense. Uh, they need a little depth at receiver, a uh, center. Uh, again, if Powers Johnson is available, look there. Um, but I'm not going to waste much time here, and I'm taking Latu. He's fallen far enough, and I think this is a really good spot for him. I like it, and, you know, and I, and I think it fits the culture. I th- think it fits the coaching staff. You know, you now have a front that has a, you know, Latu being a first round pick, a second round pick, another first round pick, another first round pick, another first round pick, and that's that's what that guy wants. That's what um, that's that's what Todd Bowles wants. He just wants to get after the passer. He wants to be creative, but he wants to have that that security net of hey, if I have to rush three or four, I can still get home. And um, Latu presents great value here, and. You know, if these guys pan out, Kalaja Kansi and Latu, in addition to Logan Hall, who I loved coming out, just hasn't really panned out yet. Whew, that that is going to be a tough group to, to stop. All um, right. So we are on to let's Arizona. See Arizona again. So we give him Marvin Harrison at number four. Um, defensively is where I think they need some help. Uh, I think they're in the same boat as some of the other teams here. That hey, just gets. Get a pass rusher to be outside inside will make it work. Yeah, well, um, yeah what we, we went with Marvin Harrison, right? First pick. Yep. Okay. Yep. There, there isn't much left inside from a pass rush perspective. I think it's a little rich for, for Braden Fisk from Florida State, who I love, but I think he's just got day two written all over him. Just some oh, open prospects, sh- short arms. He plays light, but yeah. you get him in the right system, he'll do well. But I think first round one is a little rich for him, although that list oh, yeah. of guys that I said, hey, surprise first rounders, he's on that list, just so you know. Good. That'll be coming out next like week. Um, so I go. I moved on to the edge, and I have a guy that I've been back and forth on myself a few times, and I, I want to give this death chart a look here. I mean, you have Bilal Nichols and Tonga and Jones and Collins. You know, Zayvon Collins to me is is not someone I'm going to plan around. He's an inside linebacker converted to, to outside that I think is going to work out. Ojolari got his feet wet last year, and he flashed. But, again, I don't know if he's a, a true number one. Gardeck, to me, I'm still not a believer in terms of being a true number one guy. I want to get a pa- an outside pass rusher on this team. Yes, they need a pass rusher, yes. It's a swing for the fence. But if he connects, I think he has Khalil Mack-type ability, and it's Chop Robinson from Penn State. It's a huge risk. He, he was not very productive at Penn State. But he measured in better than I thought. I think he's just as explosive, if not more so, than Dallas Turner. And I do think he offers a little bit more from a power perspective because of his use of leverage. Um, I love the mentality he plays with. Um, He's a true leader. So it was going to be between him and Darius Robinson from Missouri. Um, He's a more inside-out guy, and I think they they already added a couple guys in that mold. And they have some young guys that I think can play that mold inside out. So I'm going to go with the pass rusher here, Trap Robinson. Yeah, the only other uh, spot that I would look at right now would be corner. Yeah. So Wiggins, if he was, it would be Wiggins or like you just went with edge. So yeah, those would be yeah, the two I would spots say I would Wiggins, go with. I, I do think they, they want a little bit more physicality on the outside. And that's okay. like the biggest... That's the biggest issue on his on his scouting report is that he's just not a very physical guy. He's very light, plays light. Okay. But it's definitely a possibility. I think Graham Barton is a conversation in that room too. Um, you know, I don't I don't love Froholt playing center there. I like Graham Barton, and I think that kind of keeps Kyler Murray safe and healthy and on the field. So they could go in a couple different directions there. But after using Marvin Har- using that first pick on Marvin Harrison, I think they got to add to that defense to, to kind of keep it a little more balanced. 
All right, next up is Buffalo. And I do believe, based on my conversation uh, with our uh, resident Buffalo insider, that uh, the Bills uh, are definitely going to trade. Uh, trade up, trade down, they're going to trade. And uh, they could definitely trade up. And if they do, it could be wide receiver. They could be looking to grab one of those top three guys. We could see the Bills making a huge move up to try to trap one of those three guys. But since we're not doing trades... And since there is still a really good player sitting there for him, I'm not going to worry about doing a whole lot of work here. So I'm just going to go ahead and take Brian Thomas Jr. Uh, for the Bills. We, 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 get, we gave him to the Colts. Oh, we did? But you yeah. have Adonai Mitchell is there. I think that's maybe maybe we got confused there that no, that's okay. between those two It probably guys. is. Let me just make sure he's on it. What, 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 that was the Colts? Yep, 15. 15. Uh, let's see. It was Yeah, Brian Thomas. Cool. Okay. All right, so, um, yeah, that means that you've got Mitchell, uh, which, again, yes, yeah, so I think we, we, we both agree that Mitchell is going to get drafted in the first round. Yep. Uh, he's just a hot guy. And so, uh, again, yeah, I, I don't think there's much of uh, a big deal, big difference, actually, to tell you the truth. So. No, there's not. I mean, if you told me right now, draft week, draft night, it's going to be reversed. Uh, Mitchell goes 15 and Thomas goes 29, uh, 28, I believe you. Um I, I want to go on record that I, I think I put together uh, my my final mock draft with write ups coming up. I'm Adonai Mitchell. I think is going to go higher than we all think. I just have a feeling. I don't have any reason other than the fact that he's a freak, great ball skills, rare ball skills, produce it. But I, I just agree. I think he's going to go higher than what everyone else thinks. But I we'll agree. see. That's the fun of the draft, isn't it? Yeah, but you're right. I think there's a lot of he's a hot name. All right, yep. Detroit's next. Detroit, Detroit, Detroit. So what what does this team do a lot of that we we often look down on, we as in the public, the media, and then it They go for it on fourth down. They they go after value at positions that the public thinks should not be drafted in round one. Jack Campbell last year, Jameer Gibbs last year. They don't get to the NFC championship without those guys. And one of the top players available on my board right now is Graham Barton, the guard slash center from uh, from sorry from Duke. Uh, coming off a of foot injury, he's fully healthy. He'll be good to go. My my problem is they just signed they signed Kevin Zeitler in free agency to replace um, the kid Jonah Jackson who signed with Los Angeles. Yeah, that was an um, important signing. Yeah. Graham Glasgow, Frank Ragno, like are those guys really the, the long-term answers inside? This team is forward thinking. They're not only thinking about 2024, they're thinking about 2025 and beyond. Yeah, Ragno so, was talking about there's some health issues there to keep an eye on. So So that that's option one. But they also option need a corner, two, don't they? They need a corner. They could even use a little bit more defensive line help. You know, the signing of DJ Reader is is gonna kind of knock that knee down a little bit. I still, I'm looking at Darius Robinson as a guy that I think is going to be hard for Dan Campbell to pass on, but look at the depth chart. I don't know where they put them. I mean, they're, they're already four deep at the end. They might even be five deep at, at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah, so well, I think yeah, gonna, I'm going to pass on pass rusher. Corner, you got, you know, do, do I like a corner enough here to, to, to go Nate Wiggins? I don't think Nate Wiggins fits, fits in with what they like to do from a physicality perspective. Okay. This is a guy. This is a team where I could see Mike Sanders still being that surprise first round pick. You know, stays in that that uh, in Michigan and then and, and sticks with Detroit. Uh, but they have a they have the nickel and Brian Branch. They signed Emmick Robinson. You know, I, has I'm anybody go with fallen in our draft? By the way, right? I, I'm going to go with my gut and just say like, hey, this is going to be another decision that everyone criticizes because okay. of positional value. And I'm going to go with Graham Barton, the the interior. I would even say I'm just going to call him an offensive lineman because he can project to five spots. Graham Barton, offensive like lineman from Duke. Yeah, especially because again, as we said, there's talk about the health of the long-term health uh, at center, and then uh, Glasgow is not getting any younger. It's, neither is Zeitler, so um, they know how important the offensive line is. And by adding another talented, versatile player, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so that is Detroit. Now we go with Baltimore and uh, the Baltimore Ravens. Um, they are definitely looking at wide receiver as a top need. Um, it, it's interesting how last year it looked like, well, we've got all the receivers now, well, Lamar Jackson, and now one offseason later, they need receivers again. So uh, they definitely need receivers. They also need offensive line help um, because at guard, 
yeah, that's you don't want to have Voorhees uh, and, and 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 nothing else. So um, and 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 I'm not even sure how how comfortable they are with Philele as a right tackle. That's still an iffy proposition. So um, I think because of the way that our board has fallen. You know, I know there are a couple of wide receivers out there that could go here, like McConkey and Worthy, because of Worthy's speed. I would probably say Worthy would be a player that they'd love to have on the roster with his speed and Lamar Jackson and so forth. Um, and then as far as offensive line on our board, uh, we still have the the kid from Oregon State is still available. Uh, he's the top guy, I think, that we still have available at offensive line. So yeah. I want to make sure that... Uh, so you got Worthy, and then also they, they can use a little bit more on the edge because Jabo hasn't done much yet. Away has been disappointing. Um, uh, Robinson is available on the edge uh, right now. He's the top edge guy, I believe, available. So I think that's what we're down to. We're down to – let me just make sure I've got these updated. So we're down to uh, Robinson on the edge, uh, Fuaga at tackle, or – Worthy. I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and say, let's go with Worthy. Okay, they, that's let's, fun. Let's, let's that's put a fun that, pick. Let's put that blazing speed guy at wide receiver because I'm not it's even funny. sure. I'm not even it, sure how it, long it, Bateman's going to be there. Right. I mean, his his physical build, style of play, why you're drafting him, is pretty similar to a pick they made previously, and that was um, Marquise Brown out of Oklahoma. You know, and it worked out oh. early on. Um, you know, the question of drafting worthy is does this does this team get a little insecure about the fact that, you know, two consecutive first round picks on guys that are on the smaller side? Um, maybe that doesn't matter as much in this offense. I mean, I'm always a speed oversized guy at receiver now because you're just not allowed to touch these guys. So how physical they are doesn't matter as much as it used to. And speed kills. We're watching Miami do it uh, with guys that are both really small, Jalen Waddle, Tyree Kill. Um, and I, I think that is what brings the best out in Lamar Jackson is speed on the outside because it just stretches the entire defense. Yep. And you give a guy like Lamar with his running ability more space to work with because you're stretching the defense, that's where you see the best Lamar. And now you have Derrick Henry in the mix to, hey, when teams start to favor, um, you can just hand the ball to him and go let him run over defensive backs that are trying to keep up with with Worthy, Worthy and Flowers. So I, I like the move. I do think they need a receiver. I think that's got to be priority A or B for this team. Yeah. And again, we t- McConkey. I don't think they would need McConkey as much as Worthy because uh, Flowers can kind of fill that role that McConkey's doing. And uh, yeah, um, Aguilar is just a, a Band-Aid and Bateman, like I said. We have no idea how much longer he's going to be here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two more teams to go, right? And that is next with San Francisco. Yep. Um, I, 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 if I'm San Francisco, I'm looking at two guys here. Uh, it's already narrowed down to two guys, and they both play with their hands in the dirt. One of them is a, is a defensive end slash defensive tackle and Darius Robinson, uh, who got invited to the draft, by the way. And that usually tells me this guy's going to be a first-round pick. It's not always like that. Brian Branch was invited last year, and he had to wait, I think, what, 12 picks in the second round to go. Um, Will Levis went in the second round. So, the fact that he got invited always is telling to me that there's first round chatter about him. Right. And they just, this team just lost Eric Armstead, who's like that outside inside threat that they developed to this big physical dude that doesn't always fill up the stat sheet, uh, but he's an effective player. And that's what Darius Robinson says to me. I don't think he's going to be a 10 sack a year guy, but I think he's going to be an important piece to a good defense. Um, the other option is, you know, I'm nervous for them at right tackle. Uh, yes. with Colton McKibbis being there and, I mean, you got Talese Fuaga wrapped oh, yeah. up in the right in oh, front yeah. of you, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, it gives them depth, which they're going to need. You know, if you're a contending team in the NFL, in my opinion, you need seven guys on your offensive line that can start any Sunday. And this puts Fuaga at the starting right tackle pretty early in his career, but it also gives you Brandon Parker and Colton Bikivitz as really quali- high-quality depth. Yeah. So I'm going to go with Talese Fuaga, tackle from – Oregon State and uh, Fawaga uh, could be there apparent at left tackle at, yeah, at some point. It could be, yeah. Yep. So um, because I mean, it's, it's only a matter of time. I mean, Trent Williams ain't gonna be around forever. So, but yeah, I, I, I don't even know if he'd still be available to tell you the truth. But again, players are gonna slip. 
So right now it has slipped where we have Fuaga. Because because did you think he'll be available this late, Fuaga? Yeah. Did I think he'd be this late? Yeah. It's tough. I mean, I've done. I'm not a huge mock draft guy, but I've done this right here and the one with our lads. And I think the one with our lads, he didn't go in the first round, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to play this right now. I just got done talking with USA Today about this. This is the best tackle group I've ever graded. Depth-wise. Um, depth, and, and even not at the – like, I've, I've graded better tackles than Fashanu and Alt, but the fact that there's two guys that I gave Pro Bowl grades to and then also this kind of depth, um, you're going to see a guy or two fall to round two. It's just by, by numbers alone. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going to be that or some of these receivers are going to drop, and to me – I, I don't think the receivers are going to drop. I, I think the, those guys are just too appetizing for for the decision makers in the NFL to to really change a game. You know, that's that's what you go after the game breakers. So, you know, am I surprised? I'm not surprised that an offensive lineman dropped this far. Absolutely not. All right, and then it's going to happen. We're going to wrap it up with the Chiefs. Like they need anything else. So, uh, taking a look at their main needs, they need offensive line help. Um, I think Morris, he's going to be their left tackle, but they don't have anything right now. If you take a look at their depth chart, I'm going to pop it up on the screen quickly here so you can see it. There's not a lot going on with depth on the offensive line for the Kansas City Chiefs. So um, so take, I, mean, I think Guyton might be the top guy left on the board. He's an Oklahoma kid, so I think they've gone down that road before, and it's worked out. Uh, they also uh, need wide receiver help. Because yes, they need to move from Marquise Brown and Rasheed Rice. They have there, but they, you know, Sky Moore has been a little bit disappointing, and they don't really have a whole lot of exciting uh, players. Uh, so, wide receivers definitely there, and I think they also could use maybe this is where the first running back comes off the board. Obviously, Pacheco's the number one guy, no question. But the guy just he's so physical, he can't stay healthy, and there's nothing behind him. Um, so there's just questions behind him. You got Edward Solaire, you got P. Ryan, Prince had a good preseason, but nothing else. So maybe this is where the first running back comes off the board. But I'm going to go ahead and just say the best player that's just available on my board at this point. And I'm going to go ahead um, and take. Uh, uh, the, I'm going to go ahead and take uh, McConkey. Okay. Um, for uh, for Kansas City. I think he would be a really good fit because he's a really... See, last year they had so many issues with the receivers because they were very inconsistent. But McConkie is yeah. like one of those guys, he's coming Safe. in, he's going to be ready to go from week one. So I think McConkie, if he's paired with a high-level passer and offensive play caller, the guy's going to catch 100 passes a year. <laughs> like, no question. Yeah, right. And I hope... I don't like the Chiefs. <laughs> I hope he goes to Kansas City because it that will be – it'll just be fun to watch. It, it really is the perfect match. I think Ricky Pearsall can be in that conversation as well. He's, he brings a little bit more size to the table. But I put measurables of McConkey next to, you know, my database of guys that uh, from previous. He, other than length, um, is really close to Garrett Wilson. You know, that 4-3-9 that he ran at the Combine, like, was like, whoa. And he runs a 4-3-9 and plays even faster because of how well-developed and polished of a route runner he is and how smart and how much he can feel the leverage of the defense. You put a smart, fast, quick, twitchy guy like that with one of the best, in my opinion, the best offensive play caller in football with a quarterback that is just five steps ahead mentally and physically of, of whatever is going around him. I mean, that to me, like, Lad McConkey is not a first round caliber guy in some offenses. It just won't work out, you know, but you put him in this offense, he could be a Cooper Cup production caliber guy. Uh, who's your top running back if if uh, if they were going to be looking for a running back? Do you have a definite he's the guy yeah, for I, sure? Trey Benson's been my RB1 since last July and I, I can't get away from it. I mean, if anything he's had he didn't have the season I wanted him to have. And this is where you have to kind of control your bias in this whole process. Because this, I can't even tell you, Greg, how long of a process this is. Like, I start, I've already started my 2025 reports and note taking and data collection. And Benson, as like, I was hoping for him to be the dude on Florida State, but they split the carries. They wanted to keep him fresh. That's just the way they did it. And then things start to fall apart towards the end of the year. But then he goes, 
he did hit metrics that I was surprised to hit. He hit. He hit over. He ran over twenty-one and a half miles an hour according to GPS data, the second most of every running back in the country last year. Think about that. Wow. At six at six one two fifteen two eighteen. I mean, this kid actually. The more I watched him, is kind of like a Brees Hall type, where he might take the league by storm. Yeah, he's you got know, home run potential. Yeah. Hopefully he doesn't hit tears ACL like, like Brees did, and I, I I still believe in Brees Hall um, in oh, year yeah. two. I always believe in guys year two coming off an ACL, so I'm I'm curious to see what he does next year. I think he could be one of the top five backs production wise in the NFL. Um, part of that's contingent on Aaron Rodgers staying healthy and on the field, but I see that in Trey Benson. Um, Brooks is coming off his own ACL injury. Corum, Lloyd, Davis, Irving, like those guys are all. It's funny my grades Blake Corum through Jalen Wright three through eight, they all finished the same numerical grade. So basically oh. like, so you know, it could Jaylen be anywhere Wright, from anywhere. Okay. And it's Cause I was going to say, you know, Jalen Wright, you have him down at eight and I know our has him as number two. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's why I'm not a huge rankings guy because you know, th- they have the same number. It's just based on where, what would I want if I was starting yeah. a team? Like I love Corum for, I think he's going to be one of the best short yardage backs in the NFL. But I don't know if I want him as like my every down guy. Yeah, Just didn't do yeah. a lot after contact at Michigan. Yeah. Um, Besides, you know, but Jalen Wright, if you want to play, if you want a home run hitter, if you want a big play, explosive play guy, that's Jalen Wright all day. So, you know that that's that's the funny thing about ranks. Like sometimes it's better to get grades out on guys so you can say, oh, they all have the same grade. You know, no one. I don't actually think this guy's five players better uh, than the other. But you know, it, it's um, it, it's a fun process, and I'm just it, it's 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 really fun looking back on how much goes into it dating back to over 12 months ago and to see that uh, this is where it comes out and we're just 10 days away. Yeah. It looks like uh, Braylon Trice and Darius Robinson are a couple of guys that we didn't go with your top defensive tackle uh, from Clemson. Uh, uh, but again, that's your ranking. Um, uh, but no linebacker was taken and no running back was taken. And Nate Wiggins is also still on the board. And no safety unless you consider Cooper Jazeen a safety. Um, uh, so, and, and you do have him as, as a safety. So, Yep. All right, Dave. That was fun. That was awesome, man. That was a lot. Just like old days, right? Yeah. Quick two, <laughs> quick two hours. Uh, all right. So, again, hope uh, everybody enjoyed it. I'm sure you have your own questions, comments, issues. Let us know in the comments section. Don't forget to subscribe because we're going to be back with more videos, many more between now and the draft and then even after the draft. Uh, we're just not going to stop with the videos. Yep. So that's why you want to subscribe immediately. Don't forget to, uh, to like and share as well. For Dave Syverson, I'm Craig De Palma. Make sure to order the draft guide. Again, go to the artlets.com website. Here it is. I don't know what you're doing without a draft guide at this point, but uh, make sure you get one. And we'll see everybody next time here on the Our Lads Football Network. And also you can check out these videos over at Prime Sports Network. Um, All right. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Thanks.